have you wondered lately why so many people are discussing and questioning the shape of our planet? Ceteticism is a strictly empirical study of the shape of the Earth, relying on direct observation, empirical information, not theorization. The average person merely believes, without ever confirming with their own eyes, that Earth is a ball, and for some reason, is convinced that not believing it's a ball is a symptom of madness. But as our special guest will share with us tonight, direct and empirical observation supports Earth as flat, not a ball, and any simple direct observation overrides any theoretical non-direct information. So NASA must be best described in terms of a conspiracy theory, and professional astronomers must be making mistakes in their calculations of distances to celestial objects. His name is Jeffrey Grupp, a veteran of this radio program. He's a retired professional philosopher and university lecturer in philosophy. He is also an author, an amateur poet, amateur painter and sculptor, a musician, and amateur anthropologist. His website is sateticism.com, and he joins us directly from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hello, Jeffrey, and welcome back to Veritas. Hey, it's great to be back. Really happy to be talking to you again. Likewise, I really, really enjoyed our first installment. And anybody who's listening to us who may not be familiar with you, I suggest that they listen to that first installment, which really discussed the damages uh, that the subliminal tube, the TV and the media creates on us. But tonight, this is something very different. A few a few months ago, actually, I became exposed about a year ago, I would say a little over less, to this flat earth theory. And then a few months ago, I found out that you were also discussing it. And the more and more people that I see discussing this, these are people that I admire, smart people. Uh, I consider this situation very, very, it merits further investigation. And believe me, folks, I've said this before. I don't adopt each any model. I'm not attached to the flat earth. I'm not attached to the spherical model. But I want to know because things don't make sense to me. And what I abhor the most is people telling me, Mel, you had to go there. Come on now, you're losing credibility. I'm sorry that you feel that way. But when I go in the ocean, when I go on top of a mountain, when I get on a plane and I see things that I cannot explain, why am I seeing that horizon completely, completely align? Why is it that from a beach I can see 80, 90 miles away and see a piece of land that I'm not supposed to see or the Chicago skyline from Michigan? Anyway, first question for you is how and when did you become a, a researcher into the flat earth? Uh, it is about uh, right around the start of 2015. So what is that? Four, uh, 16 months ago or, so, or no, 18 months ago now. Uh, yeah, I, I had a friend that just said, "Wow, flat Earth is really, uh, really blasting into the conspiracy world." And I said, "No kidding!" It just I had, I remember in my days of studying geocentrism back in 20 about the same time for me, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think I remember you saying that. Yeah. I remember when I studied geocentrism years ago, I was, I, I couldn't believe the evidence for the pro, well, pr not really for geocentrism, but problems with the heliocentric model. It was unbelievable. And then I kind of put it on the shelf and didn't look at it. But when my friend said that, it was like I was ready and, uh, for that. And then I went and looked into it. And man, I would say, you know, now I've sort of departed into my own niche of research with Flat Earth, but some of those initial studies that I did just blew me away. It's studying people like Mark Sargent and, um, I forgot the other fellow's name. Man, that's not good. <laughs> Probably, uh, I know that they're Rob Skiba, now. Eric Dubay. Yeah, Dubay. Eric Dubay, Rob Skiba. I mean, those guys really did it. They've got some fantastic stuff out there. All three of them. Um, and like I said, I've kind of moved into my own scientific or zetetic, I should say, um, mode, but, uh, that, you know, I was just taken by it. And I, there was a period of my life last year, I would say a good eight months, where I sort of just dropped everything and at certain points and was up till five in the morning. I mean, a lot of people apparently have done this when they get onto the study. And I just, uh, I wanted to really know. Uh, and, and that's how I've sort of just, well, not sort of, I've developed my own model. It's called the Zetetic Eye Gyroscope, which is a name I gave um, for a number of reasons. 
uh, and trying to figure this thing out. You know, some of the real big problems like star trails and sunset patterns on the ocean. Uh, why does gravitation exist? Why is there other are sun dogs? Why did this uh, star go in a spiral on either end of the sky? Well, you know, those are called the star trails. I just really wanted to know. And, uh, you know, in, interestingly, there are X, well, it's not a coincidence. Um, there's some numerology. I'm mean, really into numerology and there's and another, two things happened last year. That first was flat earth. And then, uh, I had sort of a violent conversion to, for lack of better words, to Christianity right on April 16. Uh, that had to do with a car crash that my family was in and a whole series of very bizarre, well, I would say bizarre events that led up four months led up to that and terminated right at the moment of the car crash. But now I've learned that a lot of Christians, I'm not going to, you know, preach Christian stuff the whole show. Just, just want to mention this quickly. Sure. I find a lot of Christians have, uh, sort of some of the same experiences that I had. Mine just happened to be quite vivid. Uh, and man, I was, that just, it took me weeks and weeks of basically just staring at the wall thinking, okay, Wow, Christianity is where I'm going here. And I thought you were a Christian I, before. Well, I believed that. No, I wasn't. Uh, I was a Buddhist and oh, okay. uh, practiced really practiced shamanism. Hence the you know where the didgeridoo comes from. And uh, no, I talked about Christianity a lot. I liked Christianity. I thought it was an interesting philosophy, but I thought it was just a toy um, for you know just like another like Taoism or. Confucianism or uh, postmodernism, just another philosophy out there. But you know, with what happened, I uh, pretty much, like Jesus says, I've dropped my nets and followed him, and I've left my whole life behind. And you know, it's been it's been great. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, be on this path. And you know, interestingly, you know, flat Earth and Christianity are often coupled together. I'm not gonna, a lot of people agree with that. A lot of people don't agree, but I'm very convinced that when I you know read the Bible, Isaiah 40, 40:22 and Genesis one that these are that's talking about you know the Hebrew cosmology ancient Hebrew cosmology is flat Earth under a dome, and uh, so I sort of you know I became a Christian last year which was a pretty violent affair mentally, and uh, once I got cruising on that I said wow well the flat Earth goes right into that and it was uh, it, you know it's just been a lot of fun to be honest uh, a whole new life for me with these two theories my Christianity is really in a lot of ways based on zeteticism my whole prayer life you know isaiah forty twenty two, talking about god right above us looking down from the center of the uh the dome they call it a tent in uh, Isaiah. you know some translations call it a tent isaiah forty twenty two. you know i a lot of times uh my prayer life i'll just look into the sky and man you really can feel you're connecting with uh christ that way talking right to him and it's uh it's powerful your whole life just uh, you let go of uh of everything and just uh, really feel a lot of that uh, ecstasy or joy of, of Christ. So anyways, uh, I just wonder been, if, if yeah. the same thing happened to you as it happened to me and it happened to many of the people that I encounter. And by the way, I go to a conference, for example, a few months ago. And even though there were, and I'm not attacking any of the, the speakers, I mm -hmm. love them all, but there were some people in the audience who wanted to learn more about the flat earth and mm -hmm. nobody, nobody in that, that, uh, conference wanted to touch that with the 10 foot pole and i wonder yeah, i don't blame right. him i don't blame him because i was one of them at the beginning last year and i'm still again i'm neutral i still need proof either way i don't believe we live in his fear yep, and i still i'm still looking but the fact that the none of these people even wanted to discuss it i wonder if it's because they thought they were going to lose credibility when i started discussing this uh, even though I criticized that at the beginning, I was getting email from people, messages all the time. Now look at this, and I would say, "Don't bother me, please. This is ridiculous." Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I would del start deleting messages until one day, one of our listeners, who was a very successful person, very smart, somebody who I trust, he said to me, "You know, I know you trust me. Please, at least watch this video." And I watched one of those first videos. I think it was Eric Dubay's, mm -hmm. and just to, it just my paradigm just shifted. Right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then at our forum, the Flat Earth post or, or, or thread has probably 10,000% more material than any other mm -hmm. topic ever. Everybody dropped what they were doing. Some people abandoned us. They canceled their subscription because said, this is ridiculous. People got into fights. It was so bad. But mm -hmm. the rest who stayed, that is the focus. 
It seems that that is what people want because if this is true, it puts any every other conspiracy to to, to shame. Really, <laughs> it does yeah. I mean, this one you, this one is special. Well, nine eleven was very scientific, but you're you know mm -hmm. you're relying on TV images and you know a lot of that. There was a lot of questions about that. I was I sort of was one of the no planers. I mean, I remember watching the NBC footage and didn't see that plane when it, the second building just blew up. And I never really cared either way. Maybe there was planes, wasn't there? Wasn't but there, you know you, could, you had evidence to look at, so that was powerful. But this one is different. This one you can verify from your backyard in a number of ways. You can go to the beach and verify it. And uh, there's there are a lot of people doing hard. Different than 9-11 where we just have some TV images that everybody's analyzing. This one, you've got people out doing – they're going to mountaintops and deserts and doing hardcore experimentation. Now, a lot of these people aren't, aren't scientifically trained. In some ways, that's good. Some ways, you know, that uh, there's some problems with that. But it's a real th – this is the thing, Mel, what, whichever side you fall on. It's a real research – a real genuine – worldwide scientific revolution happening outside of the academia, which is great because we know academia is, you know, that's big money. A lot of, you know, national science foundation yeah. agenda, you know, you, professors having to go and get their grants. In other words, the government's telling them what to study. This is, this is a incredibly exciting time, whichever side of the fence you fall on, because it is a true scientific pursuit. People have this ego. Listen to a lot of the research on both sides and they're, they're talking about what do you observe? What do you see with your naked eye? Uh, people are making models of, of, of the solar system in their backyard. Uh, my, I, I've made a model of a dome in my basement. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's really awesome if you want the truth. And uh, people, there's a lot of, you know, huge fights and name calling and, and all that. And, you know, that's going to yeah. go with the territory. That happens in academia. I come from academia. It's ego, you know? ego, right? Well, I mean, yeah, but I mean, it's expected. Academia has the exact same thing going on, except people are a little more. They try to, you know, calm themselves down a little bit more, but it's the same thing. Uh, and really, I, in some ways, you know, being from academia and then now in this pursuit, in some ways, I would say that uh, academia is uh, academia is not as daring. They're they're uh, and they're not as empirical. The uh, this study among the amateurs on you know YouTube and very like your website in various places is very empirical, and therefore you can really get to the bottom of things. And it almost gets to the point where somebody will put up a like like I've got a video. It's called Zeteticism Volume Five. I think it's a slam dunk, drop dead proof. Well, proof's a dangerous word to use, but let me say empirical verification for the veracity of the Zetetic model of our reality. And it, you really have to get to the point where somebody has to deny that they're seeing a certain image on, uh, you know, it, it has to do with sunset light patterns. Uh, when the sun is setting, um, right at right before the sun vanishes, you know, as the sun starts to sink below the horizon, about halfway down, until it's about halfway uh, in, into the horizon, you know, in the distance of the ocean. Uh, it'll make a light pattern, a line from the sun to uh, the seashore. Now, those light patterns, a lot of people say it's impossible to make the line from, from the sun to the seashore. Maybe. That's not what the video is about. I specifically say that's not what we're talking about. And that's an interesting study, but not what I'm talking about in this video, which is available on my – anybody can watch it for free. It's at .com or um, better, you can get to it by Peace and Love. Dot, sorry, peace, love, and flatter dot net is a better way if you don't feel like trying to remember um, zeteticism dot com. But uh, this video shows that the light patterns there's about six or seven specific light patterns that happen when the sun is setting. Now, first thing you say, Mel, is wait, why is there more than one? If it's a if the Earth is a sphere. There's going to be one light pattern, and that is when the sun is vanishing behind a concave surface. Sorry, sorry, convex surface. Uh, in other words, like when you're, if you have a beach ball, and you can have a lighter behind it, and you make the lighter go behind it. Or you, I, what I do in the video is I take a symbol from my drum set, and I have the, a lighter go behind uh, the symbol, sort of exactly mimicking uh, a situation of a light vanishing behind the horizon of a convex surface. A domed shaped surface and it makes a very specific light pattern every time it's it's optics one it's a simple optics experiment you can do well mel you're gonna have to tell me why 
sunset patterns not only ma- they make the opposite pattern in many cases, but they make all different kind of patterns. This is, I mean, this is a simple issue, and a lot of people will think, "Oh, this is so simple, I can't really even believe this." But really, it's a drop dead. There, this is one of the numerous number of really drop dead. I'm going to use a strong word. I'm going to say proofs for that the Earth is not a ball. P- period. And my zetetic model is a little different. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, now that folks who have listened to maybe two or three Flat Earth shows we've done, which mm-hmm. were more like uh, Flat Earth 101, 102, but this is yeah, beyond that. This is beyond that, isn't it? Well, I don't want to put myself on a pedestal like I'm great or something, but I, Mel, I really wanted to, last year, I, I'm still hardcore on the research. Um but last year was quite a year. I mean, I just really hit it. And I wanted to know, and I wanted, I, I, I quickly realized there's not really a model out there that is hardcore scientific that anybody can verify from the beach, from their backyard, from the sidewalk that shows which is the true ball or flat and, uh, gives us scientific data, which is not playing games, you know, questionable stuff, but I mean, which is absolutely simple, which cannot be denied. So how different uh, is your model versus the one that we've been discussing for the last year? Yeah, my, there's a couple models out there. Uh, mine is really, it's only got, I'd say two major differences. One is that the plane of the earth is, it's not perfectly flat. It's embowed. Uh, which would mean if you've, uh, if you take a dinner plate and it curves, you know, um, this is in the Bible, actually. I can't remember. Man, I'm sorry. I wish I had the verse. I think it's in Jeremiah. They talk about the shape of the earth is like a rubber stamp, sort of a bow. Then he the rubber stamp's got the, or I forgot what term they use, the, the wax stamp, you know, on a letter. And it's sure. got the ice, ice wall around it. And everything's pretty, pretty interesting. But, um, but imagine like a dinner plate with a slight curvature to it well, a better word to use the curvature is too loaded of a word because people say oh wait a minute but embowed is the word i like to use just because it gets people less riled up um so imagine a dinner plate uh and now put it inside of a beach ball and spin the beach ball around where the dinner plate you know imagine that there's an equator of the spinning beach ball and put the center of the dinner plate right on that equator and that's the flatter system so you're in so the beach ball is the dome and the dinner plate, which has a embowment, but is more or less, you can term it as in the class of flat items, like what I, you know, calls it zetetic items. But do you have the word. plate horizontally or vertically? Uh, it doesn't really matter. It's just, it has to be on the equatorial spin, on uh, of the, so if you've got, imagine the beach ball spinning and imagine it's spinning on an axis, you know, uh, so it's, right. imagine it right towards you. Uh, you're, you're staring at the beach ball and it's spinning. So the part closest to you is, uh, is the equator. Okay. Um, and then the two poles are, uh, you know, up at the top up and, and down. up at the bottom. Furthest from you, yeah, right at that equator, imagine the center of the plates, you know, pressed on the inside because it's spinning around, going around and around. Uh, in that, um, you know, if you have a bucket with a, a rock in it, uh, and you put tie a rope to the the bucket. You can whirl it around, and the bucket the the rock will stay pressed to the back of the bucket. It won't flop out unless you but, stop. But why don't it. we feel movement at you do. all? Do you we? do? You do. You feel that's called gravity. Um, you mean move- towards the ground? Yeah. This the spinning is, causes a centrifugal force of the spinning of this. Uh, well, I call it a gyroscope. Because, well, I mean, that, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so we're inside of a, it's like we're inside of a spinning, spinning, spinning sphere. And imagine that, uh, maybe, you know, 30 or 20 or 30% of it is where the crust of the earth, the, you know, the rock or whatever of the earth is. Uh, so it has that slight embowment and it, we're, we're spinning right along the equator of that, uh, Object and that spinning causes centrifugal force, which is in dis- even the academics will agree that ac- centrifugal force that that pr- like you imagine the rock being pressed to the back of the bucket as you whirl the bucket around on the string. The, the reason the rock stays pressed on the bottom of the bucket as you whirl it around is because of centrifugal force. Well, that exactly is like gravity. 
and that's what uh, almost the like a involves. like a. Um a bucket with water, you turn it around and the yep. water doesn't fall. Or, you you know, in those in your county fair, you see this this uh, ride, which is a circle, and you get on it. They turn it around and you feel like you're attached to the wall. Are you talking yep. about that? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like um, those whirly. Yeah. Right. When you're on those whirly, uh, you know, those swings that you go on on the fair and you, you start to swing out as you're going right. around. That's the centrifugal force of the spinning. Now, if there was a wall uh, that you could bump into, you know, you you would you would press into the, the a wall that was on that. Well, this is kind of getting to be too vague of a description, but yeah, you know, we can feel centrifugal force when we're spinning around and things. And even if you do ring around the rosy with someone, if you get going really fast, you feel yourself. If you, everybody lets go, they fly backwards, mm-hmm. go fly all over the place. Um, that's just centrifugal force. Now, you might say, well, okay, that's a nice theory. How do we know this is happening? Right. And well. Uh, there's there's a number of ways to explain that. Maybe the first way – this isn't just an idea. Oh, we can't, we can't think of anything else to discuss to describe gra- gravitation. So we'll just come up with this. And there's other theories out there. Uh, there's a density theory, which I don't agree with that one because something has to cause density shifts, you know, the, the heavy to be on the bottom and the, the light to be on the top in the atmosphere. And, you know, then you're leaning back to something causing the density. And so then we're going back to original gravitation description. But anyway um, – the reason that to believe that we are – well, first of all, we're, there's reasons to believe that we live in this embodied zetetic flat – you call it a flat earth plane or zetetic plane, but it's really got this slight embowment to it. So let's go with that for a second and we can get to the evidence. Well, we've already Before you one. go there, if, the, if it's embowed, then how does water remain so flat? Well, water wouldn't be flat because this, if you look at the sunset patterns we described, they are – the sun is when it sets on the horizon and makes a line from the horizon, the sun ball setting behind, you know, the horizon to the beach. Look at those patterns and those, you can mimic those with different surfaces, like take a symbol and flip it upside down. So you're have a lighter setting. You can then bring a lighter. I do this in this video as a Tetris is in volume five. You can mimic this by holding a symbol upside down and letting a lighter pass behind it. And you'll see that <laughs> actually that's the pattern that the sunset typically makes not every time, but like over half the time there's different patterns and we'll get into that. Why that's the case in a second. But the point is, is that water, if water was perfectly flat, what you would have is each time when the sun is, is starting to dip into the horizon at sunset, you'd make a perfectly uniform line from sun to beach, but you don't. It has all kinds of mixed d- different kinds of triangular shapes, which indicate that there's an inverse curvature. In other words, a concavity or an embowment. On the surface of the earth, it's it's a real simple issue, and you, somebody's got to wonder why nobody's discussed this before. He, I'm just some nobody. Why am I the first person in hundreds of? I, it's got to be somebody else has discussed this and just gotten sort of flushed under the under the carpet or something. I mean, there's so many big issues like that, Mel, out there. That, like the moon, the the moon phases mm-hmm. don't match up to the sun. Uh, you know, I was just outside the other day, and the moon. If you look at the moon phase, the moon's like point is if there's a light this is in the morning there's a, if a light source is way up in the sky and the sun's just coming up over the horizon i'm like okay we've got hundreds of years of heliocentrism from copernicus and all the rest of the guys nobody's discussed this that this we we're, we're just supposed to believe that the sun is illuminating the moon which uh but nobody's discussed well the angles don't line up and then you've got this guy named what's his name v sauce or something on the internet i was going to make a video on attacking his uh he he tries to explain this with these things called terminator lines and he comes up with a model where he's he's got a camera in a room and anyway if you watch his model it doesn't mimic the sun and the moon he he's got his camera in the wrong place and anyway it's hard to explain but people try to describe try to attack and say oh no the the angles don't when the sunlight shines in the moon should be illuminated as if it's facing the sun not are you also saying? Com- are you also saying that the moon has its own light source? Um. Well, yeah. I. I but I don't have any idea what that is. Uh, I've got on my website. You know, I've done some of those moon experiments. I've done it twice now. In fact, I'm going to do it a third time. I just got two different. I'm going to do two thermometers. Anyways, the experiment the temperature. is temperature. Yeah. Yeah. You, you. You. Well, the way I do it is I get some glasses of water. I get the sink all hot, and I. They're about 100 degrees of hot water, and I'll make sure that the same temperature. And then I'll take 
a magnifying glass and concentrated moon put in dark put concentrated moonlight on one glass, not the other, and the other it cools down five. Really? Or 10 yeah, that's a new thing. That's because I've I've seen the 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 experiments with the thermometers, just with the the uh, shade and you know no shade, and it, it does register a few degrees of uh, difference. But you're basically saying that what I used to do with my magnifying glass in the sun, you, used, you are doing it with the moon. And it does the opposite thing. It cools wow. the water. Now, there's, I know there's, um, there's a guy, Jaren is a very, very popular flat earther. And he's got a video out there saying that the moon doesn't cool. And, you know, I'm just going to publicly say that I saw that video one time and it's, it's very sloppy. And there's all kinds of questions. I just sort of disregard that video. And he's got to make a new, uh, not, nothing against him personally. And I'm sure, you know, he may get, people may get mad at me saying this, but I'm just trying to be constructive here. The video is sloppy. Anybody's seen it. Can, can I never had the problems? He's got to redo it. Um, because I, my, my videos, anybody can reproduce. And do you have a video showing what you just did with the magnifying glass? Yeah, I've got two uh -huh. of them. I've done the experiment twice and I was going to do it the other day when we had full moon two weeks or so ago, but I just, you know, I was busy doing some other stuff. Yeah, there, it has the titusism.com or peace, love and flat earth.net. It goes to the same place. Just scroll down there and you'll see cooling moon. I'm looking right at it. concentrated moonlight cools water much faster than non illuminated moonlight experiment one. And then there's experiment two. And it does the same thing both times. Now, I'm going to do it a third time. I've got two thermometers this time. And I'm going to do it a couple different ways. Just use different thermometers. Just because I want to make sure. I mean, I'm using a cheap thermometer, the same one. And I'm kind of moving the, the probe from glass to glass. And that's all. It seems fine. But well, two, I wanna... ti two times is a burden of proof. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it several times. Um, I, like I'm doing right now, I'm doing an experiment on, uh, you know, according to the Zetetic model, the sun would appear to shrink if if the sun is low and small, and it's just a ball moving across the Earth at three, six, five, seven thousand miles or whatever up in the sky. It's gonna shrink in size like the way uh, you know if you, if I'm pulling a basketball that, that beach ball if I move it away from you it's gonna shrink in size according to perspective as it gets it's gonna appear smaller and smaller that is as it gets further and further away. Now the sun very clearly does that, and when you have when you have those when you have videos of you know when the sun gets right near sunset and it's it's real dim, you can almost yeah. look, look like right across Lake Michigan and look right at it with the naked eye. Right. You know, then you don't have any camera glare or anything. You there's a lot of video footage. I did a huge exhaustive study last year. I found every single piece of footage I could of the of sunsets where you didn't have when you where it was such where you had a nice clean edge and there wasn't any camera glare or anything. And every single video except one showed the sun shrinking exactly in the same way. And there was, and I mean, we're talking about dozens. Now, there was one that I measured it over and over, and it didn't do it. I didn't put it in the video because I wanted to think about it. Um, and now I'm doing, there's been a lot of people saying, no, no, you have to do filtered experiments. And I'm in a big study right now where I've got, I'm on my 11th uh, time-life measurement where I measure the sun basically, basically from, uh, I'd say about 50 degrees, uh, I don't know, yeah, 50 degrees down to about 25 degrees in the sky every day at sunset. I'm, per I'm choosing those, that, those areas of the sky purposely for reasons I'll explain in this video I'll have coming out in the fall. On this, and I'm going to try to get up to 30 or 40 or 50 time lapses, and you know, it's uh, it's revealing some surprises. I don't want to get into now because uh, I don't know what they mean, but it's the study is not quite revealing what I thought, and I've got to figure out what it all means. But anyway, to make a long story short, time time lapse footage of the sun right at sunset it seems to reveal uh, the sun shrinking in the exact same way, which be a, would be a drop dead proof that heliocentrism is gone, history dead. Death to heliocentrism. And uh, there is the one, though, that doesn't. Now, that could be, if the sun is changing its elevation, it could be such that there is, uh, where the sun, there, the, if the sun is changing elevation, it could, in that one video, it doesn't shrink. Now, anyway, I have to go back to that video. I'm going to put that video in this video I've got coming out with all the filtered sun footage. So the point is, is that filtered sun footage and non-filtered sun footage are two different studies. And anyway, I'm, I'm, I don't need to talk about it now, but that'll be a big video I've got coming out in the fall, which people should check out and it'll have definitely have some surprises. So, um, but yeah, so back to the moonlight. Now the sun, as far as I, I, I've never measured the moon across the sky. Um, now I don't know if it shrinks or not, but, um, now going back, to I the see moon, the moon when it's in closer to the horizon, mm -hmm. it's always much bigger. Yeah, that's what, um, 
I need to measure that for myself. I know people say that, and that that could be the case. And that'd be interesting. But I, I need to uh, I need to do that measurement myself. Some people I've heard academics say it appears much. It, it's not supposed to be much larger, according to Hilo. Such as it's supposed to be exactly the same. I mean, basically the same distance all night. And um, so I've heard academics say, oh, no, that's an illusion because it's down near the horizon and it's next to buildings and stuff. And it just looks so big. And then when you're up in the sky, there's nothing around it. It looks smaller. Now, this these, this is all theory. This needs to all be checked out with experimentation to see what's going on. So there will be three three options. Either the moon stays the same size or it gets is smaller and gets bigger as it rises or it's bigger and gets smaller as it rises. So, well, when, I, when you said that you know it's scientifically and empirically impossible to determine – with your own eyes that the sun is millions of miles away. However, you say that it's empirically verifiable by anyone who has a cell phone or a camera to verify that the sun is extremely close and just a few thousand miles in altitude. And I think the same thing could be said about the moon. Well, again, I want to do that. The more I get into zeteticism, the more I, I know that, man, you really have to base it on experimentation because this is a new study. It is complex. There's no one person out there that's going to figure it all out. Right. This is going to take hundreds or thousands of people on both sides, attackers of it and proponents to get to the bottom. And, and I think that where we are now, like the, like the embodied plane, I know a lot of people don't like my model for that. But that was a surprise when, uh, cause I'm like, man, the, the gravitational centrifuge, centrifugal force is gravitation, which we can get back to that in a second. That really sort of predicts that. The Earth is in bow, and I'm like, how do you verify that? And I, I thought about that for months and months last year, and then all of, all of a sudden, I was looking at a sunset as I looked at so many. I'm like, why is that? Why is the light pattern that way? And again, it's just that's a big surprise. Uh, it, it, I think it's somebody's going to have to explain to me how the plane is not embowed slightly, as we've been discussing. I know people have not liked that me saying that because they, they, people want to think of it as perfectly flat. Well, hey, fine, but you're, the the empirical evidence would indicate embowed. I mean, somebody's got to explain to me how those sunset patterns uh, are that way if it's not an embowed plane. Now, it's embowed in a very specific way, which I described in that video, which we don't need to get into right now. It's kind of technical and, and stuff. But you, you opened a new door for me today here because I, I was not aware of this, and my mind is just going there. The same thing that happened to me in May of last year is happening to me right this second. I'm just trying to picture mm. what you're saying. I see the, 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 the plate in the middle going around, if you will, which mm -hmm. makes me wonder, what's under the plate? If we are above the plate, what's under the plate? Could it be Well, another? probably more domes. There you go. Yeah, I mean, the dome really is a is a is probably a ball. Um, we, we can just see the top. Now, okay, there's so much to discuss here. How do we know it's Sun turning? dogs. Well, yeah, yeah, we're getting, you know, that's, you know where I'm going. Well, first of all, let me just say, how do we know it's turning? Some people might say, well, that's a nice idea that we're, okay, so, so we have a dome. How do we know it's a dome? We'll get to that in a second. That's sun dogs. And how do we know that it's turning? Well, we can see the stars turn through the night and they turn exactly on, in the north, there's a, they're all turning around a specific point. And in the south, they're turning all around a specific point. It looks exactly like we're inside of a ball. That, like a glass ball where outside of it are, with respect to the ball, are stationary light sources. Called well, it stars. feels like we're on top of a phonographic record looking up to the North Star. Ex yeah, exactly. I mean, so the, we know it's moving. The, the, what we're in, something's moving. <laughs> Either the stars are stationary and we're moving with respect to it or vice versa. Um, now let's go to the dome though. Um, yeah, this is, this is, this is a hot issue and I, I've got uh, quite a bit more work. I'm, I'm really busy. I'm, I'm getting another degree actually right now, uh, to do with, uh, my, uh, new, uh, Christian life, but which is taking up a lot of time, but I plan on doing quite a bit more. The dome is the biggie. This is the big issue. There's a couple hot issues. The, the embodied, uh, sunset patterns, the, uh, the dome verified through sun dogs, which I'll get into in a second. Um, the, you know, the sun changing size, uh, as it rises, getting bigger as it rises and smaller as it sets. I mean, these, just any one of these issues with drop dead empirical evidence that anybody can verify in their backyard destroys heliocentrism and will verify something like the ancient Hebrew, uh, cosmology. Now, okay, so let's get to sun dogs. Um, this is, this is, this may be the biggest issue of all. And, um, last year, I, I remember, I don't know. It's, you know, when you have a premonition, you, um, well, anyway, in, in, uh, 
I was doing some research on other stuff. I'm always, you know, researching things. And I remember seeing Sundogs in 2014 and thinking, wow, what are those? That's really wild. And I read there were ice crystals in the atmosphere. And I'm thinking, huh, it's kind of weird. And I didn't think much of it. Then I came across this flat earth thing. And I always kind of had Sundogs in my mind. I'll explain what they are in just a second. Um, and then uh, uh, one day, I remember I was sitting at my parents' house. This is, man, this is going back about 16 months ago. And I said, I wonder what would happen. You know, a sundog, I, that just, I know that looks like an optical, uh, reflection pattern, which is on, like, the inside of a concave surface. In other words, if you take a lighter and put it inside of a bowl, it's gonna make a right. specific optical pattern. Cause I know those, what are called the parhelia, the edges of the sundog, that, that's indicative of a concave surface. Very clear. Now, anyway, what a sun, you, somebody will have to go look up sundog, one word, sundog, or parhelia, P-A-R-H-E-L-I-A. Uh, that's the more scientific term. The second is um, now what they are is basically uh, they, these are present every single day. A lot of people say they're really rare. They are not rare. It just is it has to be the case that the uh, ice crystals or fog or snow or clouds or whatever are positioned right in the atmosphere where we can see this incoming reflection off of the the dome. Um, now, what a sun dog looks like for those since people are going to want to know not going to want to look it up if you're not at a computer it looks like you've got the sun in the middle and there's a huge ring around it and on the on either side of the ring horizontal to where you are are these big bulges which are called sun dogs and they're very specific triangular shapes and there's a whole bunch of other intricate patterns to sun dogs too which i won't explain which you'll anybody else if you know you've got patterns on the bottom patterns at the top it's just an, and they can get stunningly complex and scientists just scientists just say well this is just light coming into the atmosphere well, here's the here's a definition as you said sun dog mm -hmm. is parhelion a bright spot in the sky appearing on either side of the sun formed by refraction of sunlight through ice crystals high in the earth's atmosphere do they say refraction refraction or reflection refraction where are you getting that that's a that's a weird definition go, go to google define parhelion Okay, because, yeah, okay, well, whatever. Um, yeah, what they they can't, dis okay, so, yes, a sundog does have to do with precipitation in the atmosphere, whether it's snow or fog or, or you know, it's cold, cold air will be crystal, they have little crystals floating around, diamond dust or whatever you want to call it. Um, now, the, the thing is here is that if you, and, and I've got a book sitting right behind me here, Atmospheres and Halos, um, go to my videos and I show the book. Uh, it's sitting on the other side of the room, so I'm not going to get up and get it. But um, and they say this is the the Bible, so to speak, for sun dogs. This is there's a whole academic study behind this, and they say they've got a chapter in there, you know, which is kind of like why the sun creates this specific struct, incredibly intricate, complicated, repeatable structure in the sky. And they ba they this chapter is like three pages long, and they basically say in there, no explanation, it just happens. And I'm thinking. Unbelievable. Because on the other hand, these aesthetics, uh, like myself, we have a way to describe why these shapes happen. It's real simple. Just get a super smooth, it's got to be glass smooth, uh, circular bowl. And I do this in, in my videos, aestheticism volume two and volume three. Volume two, I have to redo. It's got a bunch of, it's not as crisp as I'd like, and I'm going to redo it. It's, you know, year old. I got to update it. I got a whole bunch more stuff to put in it. So that'll be redone here, hopefully this year sometime. But anyways, you just, you go, you take a lighter. Now you want a lighter. You want a light bulb or something because a light bulb or like a flashlight, they have, you should go shine a flashlight on a wall and you'll see it's not uniform light. It's got its, you know, the glass and there's dust inside. The light bulb is making different patterns and a lighter is a much more continuous uh, light source. So go put it inside that bowl as you'll see me doing the Tedison's volume two or, or three. And it, Mel, it reproduces the sundog shape so good. <laughs> it just still blows me away. Are you I also mean, implying that the sun is within the, the, the dome? Yeah. It's, it, the, the, a sundog looks like for these videos that I've made. And man, I really, that's third volume. I'll go into that third volume. I think nails it. it uh, again, I'm not trying to get credit for myself. This isn't about me. I don't care about any credit. You don't, people can cite this research. Don't even bring my name up. Well, true truth care. is devoid of all ego. Yeah. Yeah. Forget. I just want to know and I want other people to get. This is the coolest study. And uh, I know this study is a hot one and people get 
fiery on both sides, but oh, yeah. it, it's fun. But anyway, it looks like what a sun dog is, is the back of the sun. The sun's a ball spinning around. We can verify it is. It looks like it's the back of the sun reflecting off the dome, just like a lighter inside the bowl. I mean, Mel, you take those parhelia, you put the lighter higher up in the bowl, and they go they go up with respect to the sun in the center, bring it down low, like as if it's uh, a sun dog that's right on the horizon, like at a sunrise or something, and the parhelia are right in line with the sun. Oh, man, Mel, the, the same thing happens in the bowl exactly. I mimic it in the, in the videos. It's unbelievable. There's all kinds of ways that they perfectly correlate. The shape of the parhelia are the same. There's a double sun effect. And people people often talk about Nibiru as two suns. You know, I think what that is, I'm not going to say I'm, I'm they're wrong and I'm right or something, but in my opinion, from this empirical research, what Nibiru is, is the, is the back of the sun. Sometimes we can actually see the back of the sun reflecting off the dome. Oh. It's right. And you can mimic the pattern. Sometimes it's, you'll get, sometimes you get three suns and you find out that one is a, a camera glare. Right. But, but, uh, you can mimic the, uh, one that would be reflecting off the dome perfectly. And they, it always shows up. Well, it seems to most often show up during sun dog, when sun dogs are most visible. And, and the but, days I see mo- most sun dogs, folks, it's chemtrailed days. Well, yeah, because, okay, that's, yes, excellent. Or a day where it's foggy or there's right. real cold and there's misty snow everywhere. Now, the reason that is is because, man, you get, people got to go. I'm not, the videos are free. Don't even, I didn't bring my name. Now, I didn't even say this is Jeffrey Grupp or anything in the videos. I just, boom, go with the information. It's not about me. So I, people have said I'm trying to do ego. Think what you want, but it's not. Go to Zeteticism Volume 3 and you'll see what's going on you know when you have a radar dish or, or like i mean you, you you shine the sun on it and then you can put a piece of paper in front of it right where the the light converges and the light the piece mm-hmm. of paper on fire you, you know what i'm talking yeah, about yeah yeah, of course yeah that's what a sun dog is i mean you i've got a video in there of a guy holding his hand out and he moves his hand right where the light converges and all of a sudden it makes a ring right in front of the uh um you know, in front of the, the satellite dish, which is a dome. You know, he, he's doing it off the sun, reflecting. You know, he can't do it too long because his hand's getting hot. And the point here is, is that his hand is mimicking. There, there, if there's mo- a- moisture in the atmosphere in the right location, it could be clouds, s- snow, anything, it will illuminate the incoming converging light. Okay. And the, the sundocks have all kinds of convergent structures. And man, anybody who says that this is reflect, refract, well, I usually I thought people said reflection, but you said you just read a, I don't even think people even know. This is not, this is simply not reflection or refraction. This is converging light sources. I mean, you can, there's people at ski resorts that'll be sitting there standing right next to some kind of ball of light. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what is this thing? And the only thing that I mean, I've shown them in my video, it's just spectacular. Uh, and the only thing that the only thing I can do that is a converging incoming light source, which will make light sort of you know stand there in the middle of a, on the side of a mountain in a ski resort. And it, what's happening is the you know to be real cold the ski resort and it's powdery snow is in the air and the incoming converging light has something to reflect off. If that snow wasn't in the air. There wouldn't be anything, you wouldn't be able to see it because the, the light wouldn't have any, the converging incoming light wouldn't have anything to reflect off of. But when there's some kind of precipitation present, the, the incoming light will illuminate. You will see that's what a sun dog is. And man, the only thing that can create a convergence of light like that, Mel, is an inverted reflection and coming off of a concave surface. It's optics 101. I, I mean, if you, if you take that, the satellite dish and reflect light and, and put your hand in front of it where, where the light converges, it gets all hot. It, you'll, you'll basically create a sun dog picture on your hand there, as I show in this video. And so essentially that's what we are. That's what Mark Sargent called, um, sun dogs after my, the test of volume three came out. He said, we're in the cooker because essentially the sun is, uh, we're in a converging light source area. So wait a second. Sun, Let's uh-huh. go step by step here. I want to just yeah, be able yeah. to digest it all. It's technical stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because what you just said about the satellite putting in your hand, now I thought, okay, could it be that this is why we perceive the heat from the sun this way? Because the our ground is shaped that way? I don't know. I don't know. All I know, let, let me get, I think this is where we're, where you're going, where we're going here. In this video, is the Tedison, this video is the Tedison Volume 3 is the best thing I've ever made in all my whole 
career of research or anything. It, let me just explain. It shows there's a video. Some, some person in Moscow was riding on a train and there was a sun dog in the distance, right? The sun's coming up. And there's a sun dog in the distance and they're showing that the sun's flickering in and out of, I think, apartment buildings or something. And Mel, this is, this, this video nails it. Okay. Whoever this person is out there that made this video, thank you. I said a big thank you in the description of the video because what it shows is, let me just describe this. When, when the sun dog, okay, so you've got the sun in the middle and then the two on either side horizontally, you've got the two, what are called the sun dogs or the parhelias, you know, they're beside the sun. That's why it's called the sun dog and like Descartes time back in the 1700s. And as people are starting to study this, they called, they said it was like the sun beside the sun, like a, like a dog rocks beside the owner. They're a little bit dimmer, maybe, uh, and they're on either side. Uh, what is it? 22 degrees out on either side from the sun. Now, so what you're going to see on the horizon is coming up. You can see the sun in the middle and these two other pictures of the sun right on either side. Now you're thinking that they're way in the distance. Okay. Everything's far away. Nope. This video, <laughs> there's so much video and evidence. I've got my own. Anybody can go see this for themselves and find footage. They are, the sun is distant, you know, wherever it is out, uh, 5,000 miles away or whatever, whatever. That's not important. The sun dogs are right here and we're existing inside. Okay. Inside, okay let me explain here. This person's on the subway train and so the, the sun and then the two sun dogs on either side are flickering in and out of the apartment buildings. Now, Mel, the sun, when it goes behind an apartment building, it vanishes. You know, there's no camera glare, no afterglow in the camera. It's gone when it, obviously, because it's behind the building and the building's in the shade and, and the, the train's on the other side of the building. So you're, the, the building's in between the sun and the, the photographer on the train. Guess what happens with the, the parhelia on either side? When they go behind the buildings, a faint picture of them still exists. Of okay, the what sun the, dogs. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, boom. It, heliocentrism is dead. That is a don't, that's an incoming light convergence, uh, which is creating those because what you're seeing is what a sun dog, the parhelia are is they're not way in the distance. They look like they're in the distance, but they're actually long tubes, uh, from the, from where you are seeing them, you know, may, I don't know, 30, 50, 80 miles in the distance, whatever into the sky. And you're seeing like the first piece of it, uh, right up close, you know, with in between the camera and these apartment buildings. Some of these apartment buildings are only 50 feet away and you can still very clear. I go over and over. I'll show the footage over and over repeating, and you see this, the sun will go behind a building and vanish. The sun dogs go behind a video and they only partially vanish. I mean, Mel, this is just exciting stuff. I mean, we've got a whole new picture of reality coming right, right, right in front of us. So here. speaking of the satellite dish, like mm -hmm. let's, let's look at some of the, the obvious things. Satellites. Yeah. We are told that there are thousands of satellites above our heads. Your take on that. Yeah, I've, I've talked about this before. There's a lot of people getting in huge fights about this. And I mean, I get it. I get the, the, the international space station. It seems like it's fake, Mel. And I'm not going to take a stand either way, though. I mean, you can have in a flat earth system under a dome, you can have satellites. They just have to be higher than jetliners. They have to just be, be, they have to be below the dome and above the jetliners. Um, because when you're in a jet, I was just, I just flew to San Diego two weeks ago. And the sky gets a little darker when you get up there. Oh, Mel, I got to talk about something to do with stars and in planes. That's just yeah. so amazing. Second, there's so much stuff here. Um, you know, the sky gets a little bit darker and you know, so all you need to do is just go, so, and there's all these people doing these weather balloon experiments. I've never done one of these myself, so I can't verify the veracity of them, but it seems that they make sense because you get a little bit higher and the sky darkens a little more, a little more until you get up there pretty good and it gets pretty dark. But the thing is, so, I mean, the satellites just would have to be up that high. So underneath the dome above the jetliner, you know, like 50,000, uh, feet or 60,000 or 70,000. So are, we, are you saying that we lose a gravitational force even before hitting, if there's a dome before hitting the dome? Uh, it should, if it's a centrifugal force, it should be the case that as a plane goes up, it is flying in a lesser gravitational let me, let me think about this. Um, I'd have to do the math on this. I'm thinking about this off the cuff. But yeah, as you get to the center where of the spin, you're going to have zero gravitational force there in the middle. Um, 
So yeah, that, there's things like that. There's there's so many things Mel popping in my mind. Let me talk about planes for a second because sure. I've got a, I've got one video up already of plane footage. I got two more that I need to take a minute to put up. One of them Mel has. Let me just say what it is. I'm an, I noticed this ever. I used to go to Florida every year with my my parents to take us to Disney World. Man, I hated it Mel. To be honest, <laughs> all my friends are home playing fun, playing kickball and stuff, and I'm I didn't even like Disney World. Anyways. Um, so I remember always just kind of being, you know, sitting there daydreaming, looking out the window of the plane jetliner. I mean, you know, I'm 30,000 feet up, 40,000 or whatever, 38,000 feet up. I remember always watching, uh, you know, water trickle across the window and I never thought anything of it until I started studying flat earth. And I'm like, wait a minute, why in the world is there water trickling across the window? <laughs> I mean, I'm supposedly in negative 70 degrees with a 500 mile an hour wind chill coming at me. Why is there melted water going across the the windshield of the window of the plane? This, I saw this numerous times. I've got video of this for like thirty minutes <laughs> when I flew to Colorado a couple months ago. Of you know, I mean, you can see the mountains below. I've got, and then you see the right on the window there, water trickling, a ton, a lot of water. And I'm thinking that atmosphere. And this is now, obviously above the clouds. Cold. Oh yeah, well wait, you see the you see the Rocky Mountains right below. And we've got melted water. I mean, just just water trickling across uh, the window of the plane. Mel, I thought it was negative seven degrees up there in the troposphere. No, it, that is warm air. But were you and behind the engines, though? No, I'm in the I'm in the front. Okay. And, and, hmm. and you want? Yeah, I've, I've like you. I've been asking people, my wife. You know, are, do they have a coolant that cools? It makes the, anything melt in the plane. I'm just trying to find any explanation for this, mm -hmm. so I don't. But I mean, if it is the case that that's warm air. This is a big deal for flat earth studies for the following reason I can explain very succinctly. And that is because in my videos of Tedicism Volume 1, I discuss this. If the earth plane is embowed, when a plane takes off, it's going to be pointed down into the ground. So in other words, it's going to continue. It's, uh, planes that get up there are going to lose altitude. And I, I was shocked to find out that if I went and studied, uh, aviation studies this is standard that planes lose altitude the altimeters always show losing altitude and the explanation given for this is something to do with it they're being cold and i'm like okay that's interesting <laughs> so the cold is the cause for planes losing altitude uh and if that's the, but i mean but i come up with a different explanation no if you're flying taking off on a boat plane you're losing altitude because you're flying imagine you know you're in the center of the dinner plate you rise up and take off and fly towards the edge. You're flying, you know, if you fly any way out from the center, you're, f you're getting closer and closer to the surface because the, the dinner plate is, has a slight, imagine a slightly curved dinner plate. And so I'm thinking, wow, this is right in line with the, uh, embowed, uh, zetetic model. And, but, you know, they've got this theoretical explanation of uh, that cold air produces it. Well, Mel, if it's the case that there's actually warm air up there, Oh man, this there's two strikes. First of all, there's not supposed to be hot. It have to be hot air, not warm air, hot air, because it's you know you're going hundreds of miles an hour. There's going to be some wind chill, and it's still not freezing. I mean, I, all I live in Michigan, and man, Mel, if we get down to zero degrees or something, and there's any precipitation, though your windshield, it's sometimes it gets frozen up, and it's hard to get unfrozen. Okay, we're talking negative seventy degrees, negative fifty degrees, going. 10 times faster than my car will go in this melted water. No, that's warm. I, I, I'm, I think it might, that might be warm air up there. And if it is Mel, that is a huge, huge strike against helium. I mean, uh, almost a death blow to heliocentrism because it's not supposed to get that warm that low. Apparently it does get warmer way up higher or something. I don't know. There's a bunch of theoretical explanations. You know, nobody can really go up there and measure it much. You know, ordinary people, we have to sort of just to believe this on faith from what academics say is going up way up in the atmosphere where we can't measure. But furthermore, it's exactly what a Zetetic, uh, embodes Zetetic flat earth system would predict that there's, there's no, there's there. Forget if there's cold or warm air up there, the cold air theory of why planes are losing altitude is out the door. And the real reason would be probably better explained with an embode surface that you're flying into the nose of the plane is flying down. So anyway, it's oh, look at the, the, the look at the moon for example. Mm -hmm. We're told that we went to the moon. 
You remember, you and I probably are yeah. the same age. Yeah. And when we were traveling as, as kids, I remember if I had a camera with me with a you know, normal roll of film, I was told, oh, don't, don't put the camera through the x-ray machine, right? But we were able to go through the moon <laughs> through 600, yeah. between 600 and 3,700 miles of a radiation belt. And yeah. those cameras, the the house of planted cameras, they didn't have any any gold plating. The the uniforms, the the, the uh, what do you call it? The astronaut vests were not mm -hmm. gold plated. How did they do it? If Mel, they there did. are so many. Uh, the moon landing is one of those things that really gets me because Mel, there's so many problems with the moon landing. It's un. I mean, where do we even start? The problems are thousandfold. I mean, we're talking. Big problems. The moon landing footage doesn't even exist anymore. It's supposedly lost. There's no stars in the footage. I mean, how could there be? I thought I thought astronomers brought their telescopes up to the top of the mountains to get look through less atmosphere so they can see the stars better. When you get to the moon and there's no atmosphere, the stars should be incredibly bright. Yet the sky is black. And they say, oh, it's because of the cameras are bad. No, I don't. You're going to pick up some light somewhere in the sky. There's none. I mean, how did they get the cars up there? How did the? I mean, there it's. But yet, yet, if you debate this with people, there's no soil disturbance on the legs of the the lander. Yeah, yeah. And the, how did how did it take off? That you know, there, I mean, there, we could go on and on for three hours. But the thing that's most interesting about the moon landing, Mel, is that you can go and point this stuff out to people. It, I mean, it's like one plus one equals two. The sky is point to the sky blue. I mean, it's that simple that the moon landing, whatever that moon landing, I don't know what, what we did on the moon, but the moon landing footage is not actual footage from the moon, according to a heliocentric model of the solar system. And you go tell it, you go point this out to the average person and they will just deny it right, right to your face. It's like saying the sky is green or one plus one equals nine. That's where flat earth is going. There, some of the evidence is so strong that the only way people can deny it is that they start to sound like a lunatic. And the moon landing is a great example. Like, I remember 9-11 with Building 7, people would say, oh, you know, it just kind of collapsed. I'm like, yeah, no, right. it, it, how the center started to go down first, and it looks exactly like a controlled demolition. People had to start to, to really talk in absurdity in order to deny it. But what I'm seeing, Mel, is people will. People, like with 9-11 or the moon landing and now Flat Earth, people will, will go out, they'll, they'll go all the way out on a limb, and talk in, in madness and like, you know, one plus one equals, uh, 14 in order to hold on to this crazy idea. I mean, don't people want the truth? I mean, who cares what we've been told? Why don't we just get, I thought the truth will set us free. Because it I mean, hurts, Jeffrey. It yep, hurts. Yep, and some people are too right. comfortable with their living in a lie. You know, yeah. for example, the original source that had, that provided so called scientific proof of a sphere by way of a few images. Is NASA? Do you consider that scientific proof? And if so, if no, why? No, this is this is an amazing issue. Thank you for listening to the first segment of this very important Veritas interview. If you enjoyed it and wish to listen to the rest, go to veritasradio.com, click on members or subscribe, or tell someone else who will enjoy this and all our radio programs.